So this this is actually a revolution in Kibbe on Liberty because I have two guests at once, which we've never done live. Stephen, good to see you. Nice to nice to do the inaugural roundtable episode. You're a guinea pig, and um, our resident grumpy artist, um, Matt Pataglia. So thanks for having me on. I identify uh, as a grumpy artist, just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is nice. I, I just identify as grumpy, but uh, um, because we're going to talk about Star Wars today. Um, Kibbe on Liberty is such a lavishly funded and staffed organization that we actually have an in-house Star Wars scholar. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. I haven't written any books about it like you're writing, but. Well, uh, it's on the way. So yeah. we'll, we'll have lots to talk about. So let's, uh, let's, let's frame it with uh, the forthcoming book because uh, you have, is the book done? You've written a book. The book is uh, still being completed, about two more chapters to go. I owe a manuscript in May for How the Force Can Fix America, Star Wars as a Guide to Political Reconciliation and Personal Growth. It's coming out from Center Street, part of the Hachette Publishing family, and that will be on bookshelves in December. So hopefully there will be new Star Wars around that time. I think actually the book of Boba Fett is coming out right at the end of the year, so that will be a nice little news hook to try to get out there and start talking about Star Wars again. So in this uh, in this grand metaphor, who is Boba Fett in well, real life? Yeah, Boba Fett's on nobody's team. Uh, he just plays for himself. So I think uh, there's always been an argument about whether or not Han Solo was the perfect libertarian or if it was some of these other bounty hunter characters. And uh, I just think that remains to be seen. Maybe he's the crony capitalist. Maybe. Mm. He's always trying to get government contracts to chase down uh, wanted individuals for doing things that free people should be able to do. To be fair, he's not even a true Mandalorian. <laughs> Controversial right there. <laughs> so um, let's, and, I, and you, you've written a couple essays that I assume were sort of prototypes for chapters in your book. Yeah. Basically the, the grand themes of the entire Star Wars enterprise, hope versus fear. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to get into that, but for, for context, you've, you've also recently left your job where I got to know you at, at at uh, uh, Young Voices. Thank you, Jesus. You're on the board of advisors, Matt. I know. <laughs> well, I was, I was, I was going to say Students for Liberty, and I'm like, no, that's. Yeah. And of course, Young Voices was born out of Students for Liberty. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, by the way, I would love to cut that huge failure on my part out of the show, <laughs> but okay. Logan insists that it's going to be in there anyway. Yeah. That's it humanizes funny. it, like right. But okay, that's why all, your producers are We're all, we're all on the just show. people. I forget the name of my book often. It was originally "How the Force Can Fix America." Publisher wanted it to have a more wide scope so they could put it in other languages and yeah. you know sell it anywhere to "How the Force Can Fix the World." And then I also forget the subtitle of the book. I'm like, uh, "Star Wars is a personal guide to what?" Uh, it's a little bit long, so it's totally fine. But I actually still am at Young Voices, just part time. Yeah. So I'm dividing my time through a lot of different creative enterprises. So um, halftime at Young Voices, still training young people on how to get into media and sound good when they try to talk. Uh, and then there's also the book project due in May and then a new YouTube show, which I've, I've just launched. Yeah, well, talk about that. Um, uh, uh, it's the new, I don't know if it's a network, but rightly mm -hmm. at Al Jazeera. What do, you, what do you call that today? Is that... Is... Like an, a, a sub-brand underneath the umbrella. I mean, there are lots of big media conglomerates out there who then have sub-brands that operate independently. Fox Nation's not really a perfect example for Fox News because it definitely is like under their direct editorial control. But, you know, Rightly is a new project from Al Jazeera to host conversations about what's going on in the center right in America. And so I am launching their first show. It's actually already out. It's called Right Now with Stephen Kent. And it's a weekly where we have conversations about 45 minutes to an hour about what is driving the discourse in the center right in America and where the Republican Party is going. I try not to make it too much about the Republican Party because partisan politics is a construct and very confining and what you can talk about. It has to be like red versus blue all the time. But I think you know this better than anyone. There's a lot of disruption going on in terms of the ideology on the right. Yeah, yeah, I, I know. And and from my perspective as a former Tea Party organizer, those, those values that we had uh, circa 2010 – uh, limiting executive power and fiscal responsibility mm -mm -mm. and individual liberty. Um, I don't hear, um, I can count, and maybe on one hand, how many Republicans espouse those values today. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's sort of tragic. But yeah, there's this national conservatism, uh, whatever that is, is a different thing. 
Yeah, we launched the show. Uh, week one was the 12 year anniversary, I believe it was, of the Tea Party movement really kicking off with that uh, that event that happened on CN- CNBC um, about uh, calling for a new American Tea Party. And so we began the show with a reflection on that because that was my entry point to politics. Um, not necessarily you, but the Tea Party movement and what was going on at Freedom Works and sort of the Coke Network, like that was my onboarding point to being interested in politics. I was working in hospitality before, and I wanted in on that. I really believed in what was happening there uh, 12 years down the road. Uh, none of it has has come to fruition. The icons of the movement um, have either moved on from it and rebuked it, or the politicians uh, are out of Congress, or they are now complete big government shills. So right. Yeah. It didn't work. <laughs> it's And the, the, the strategy, and this is related to, to where I want to go today, but the, the strategy was always to create a community of people with a shared set of values that would create an incentive for politicians to do something smarter than what they would naturally do, mm-hmm. which what they, what they naturally do is accrue power and spend money they don't have and and help themselves at the expense of everybody else. And we were trying to create that, that culture of those, what I would consider very American values. And, and that, that, of course, is what we're all doing here because we want people to think about the world in a way that's um, tolerant and open and thoughtful, which gets me back to your show and, and the themes from Star Wars. Like um, so much of modern media is just clickbait. And I hate clickbait worse than anything, even if it's clickbait that sort of pushes my buttons. Because mm-hmm. there's the, you, don't, you, you get dumber every time you consume something that just reaffirms your, your pre-existing biases in my mind. And I watched your first show, and it seems like you're pushing against that. That's, that's my wife. Yeah, trying, trying my best to push against it. Um, you know, we're going to have conversations about what's going on within the Republican Party. But, like, even what I mentioned there is, like, if you are too hung up on the battles that are going on in Congress and, you know, who's going to be the next Speaker of the House for the Republicans, like, you've already lost. We are fighting a bigger battle, which is between individualism and pluralism versus authoritarian attitudes that are rising on the left and right. And so for right now, what I want it to really be about is how do we preserve a strand of liberalism at the heart of American politics when both parties are very ready to move on from it? Because it's the only thing that brings us to the table to believe we have anything to discuss. If you can't have conversations, you have nothing left but recourse and violence. Um, And we need to find a way back to that. So, you know, along the lines of trying to do an interesting public affairs political talk show, going to try to orient people back in that direction. I think that's a, a worthy project. Yeah. And and we should define liberalism. You mean it in the classical sense of of uh, open conversation, free speech, all these really radical ideas. That, Openness. You yeah. know, it was <laughs> I came up in the in the 90s. So the coexistence bumper sticker was like the idea of what it meant to be a liberal. It was very popular at the time. If someone was going to vote for Al Gore, they were going to vote for Kerry, and they were, you know, they probably had a coexist bumper sticker on their car, and you're like, okay, I think I know who these people are, and it has all the different religious symbols around it. But if you talked to, like, people on the left or the Democratic Party today, there's an element of that that is almost uh, wrong think, that there cannot be coexistence if one group exists because their existence threatens all of the other ones. Um, it's a very different ethos, and yeah. we need to get back to that. That's liberalism worth keeping. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I miss the old ACLU, and I miss um, the, the elements that were across the political spectrum. And I, I, would, I would call that more of a libertarian instinct, but mm-hmm. um, you know, labels are confusing. Let's, let's go to the theme of the day. Like, um, why are you writing a book about Star Wars? Why should any of us care? Well, there are a couple of different reasons. The first is that I am a, a Star Wars fan through and through. That is my primary identity outside of being a father and a husband. Uh, that is my, not my religion. I'm a religious person, but it is a huge part of who I am and how I foundationally see the world. Like, there is a really great story in the Bible to be told about redemption and, and coming back from the dark. But like my truest story of always believing that there is hope, that there is life beyond our sins, actually comes from Star Wars. I learned that story first. And in a world where all of our senses of 
faith and belief and association to one another are crumbling around us, whether it's our communities and our clubs or our you know, belief in, in, in God, right? You're going to always have a different religion. We've kind of seen what wokeism has sort of served as a sense of religion for others. And what I want this book to be, How the Force Can Fix the World, is, well, if we're going to have sort of secular faiths, right? A Star Wars faith is actually a pretty good one. The Ten Commandments of Star Wars are very good. Yeah. Uh, don't give in to fear. Have hope. Believe in humility. Believe in people. And accept the capacity for people to uh, experience redemption. There's a couple different more along the line, including like free will. But Star Wars at its core even though the fans will always try to turn it into a pissing match between both sides, even mm -hmm. left and right fans, it has core virtues and they are worth, uh, worth talking about and trying to uphold. Yeah. And, and you're like an unhealthy obsession with star Wars as well. Yeah. Um, I think it used to be unhealthier. I, I, I felt that, <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I, the pissing match between fans I find is, is the most difficult thing because, now it's no longer about the merits of Star Wars or the the actual piece of entertainment that you're consuming. Yeah. It's it's about fifteen other things that it's have proxy nothing war. to do it. Right. Star Wars has fallen subject to the same culture war proxy wars that everything else has. And I, I, I try my best to reject it at mm -hmm. every turn. Like they want you the Star Wars fans and the political pundits in particular, like they want you to be up in arms about stuff that goes on behind the scenes at Lucasfilm and based your opinions on the product itself based on the politics of the people. And I just try to always be hands off from that. And, and yeah. right fans don't like that about me, but <laughs> that's who I am. So, uh, I, I am curious, though, is I think that from, from what you just said, I feel like the original trilogy of movies has the cleanest arc for, for the, the redemption story and, and espousing those positive virtues. Whereas I've always felt that the, you know, the prequels are interesting in almost a governmental allegory. Mm -hmm. And then the, I don't know, the D Disney trilogy. I don't know how we're referring to it. Uh, the sequel trilogy, the Disney <laughs> trilogy, but there will be more and then we won't be able to call it that. So. Um, but the, so the current Disney trilogy, right, to me, feels almost like um, a reflection of the modern lack of faith in all institutions because so much of that series is this tearing down and not quite building it it's built back up differently and mm -hmm. the redemption is not quite clear and there's not uh there's a lot more more gray in there than in the, the original one is a very good evil tale well yeah there's a couple things so there are there are politics in the in the disney trilogy and some of them are good there's a really great strand of thinking about um particularly like far-right militant movements and what happens when you push the fascists off the board, right, in the original trilogy. Are they gone or do they come back? Mm -hmm. And if you don't deal um, with remnants out there in the galaxy, they're going to, to manifest again, try to grab power. That's what the First Order very much is. And also what happens when you don't put to bed lies about evil regimes. Kylo Ren is created off a misunderstanding of what happened at the end of Darth Vader's story. He was not told uh, about the full story of Darth Vader coming back to the light and realizing what he had done wrong, just that he experienced a moment of weakness. And that's how we see the worst bad ideas in history just continue to come back over and over again as lies around what really happened. Um, the, the redemption arc in the prequel trilogy is, is there, but I never really was able to connect with it, partially because... Whereas George Lucas had a plan, he had a vision for three movies mm -hmm. and then the prequels that came before that, Disney was moving movie to movie. Yeah. They're going, we're going to make this one, see how people react, put it through a focus group mm -hmm. and then we're going to do the next one and then we're going to get scared of the fan blowback and we're going to go back in the other direction. And it's, it's schizophrenic and it makes it really hard to track the narrative of those movies as a result. Yeah. Art, art by committee never really works. It can't work. Um, and, and that's why, so we, we were arguing about discussing this before be, before you even got here where in this my feeling is that that the prequel trilogy as much of a mess as that that series is at least has the artistic justification of the creator being george lucas and he had a very i think at the you know and and it the the point has grown clearer as time's gone gone mm -hmm. on um it, it is it is very much the power grab that happens under 
basically the war on terror. I mean, that's what the, that trilogy is basically about. Right. Um, and, and so we can quibble about a lot of the poor writing, poor acting and whatever in those things, they had some artistic justification. Whereas that this, this, the Disney trilogy suffered from not having this coherent ethos in, in at least in my view. But, um, I, I am curious a bit more about, I read your articles about hope and fear and i was wondering if you could kind of explain a little bit about what your feelings were about star wars and oh i mean where to begin the the core thing that star wars is always reminding you to do is reject fear that is lesson number one Uh, it's fear leads to anger anger leads to hate hate leads to suffering and we know this to be true we know that it is a slippery slope but we are currently in the throes of a social movement where fear, paranoia, and emotion are not held up as things to be wary of, but things to be to be praised. They are virtues in themselves. Um, I see this particularly among younger generations. Uh, it is a political problem that your emotions are something that deserve to be vindicated at all times. The Jedi were this group of people who sort of embraced a, a too far version of stoicism, that emotions are fully dangerous, and they must be disregarded and held at arm's length at all times. And what that does is create an exoticism to having emotions and people who don't know how to healthily engage with their emotions. And Anakin Skywalker ends up being uh, case number one for that. Like Mm -hmm. he doesn't know how to manage emotions and it destroys him. Um, Fear in the context of the prequel trilogy is is definitely a commentary on the Bush years, the war on terror. It's a valuable lesson. It's mm-hmm. one that I remember conservative fans not liking because it was a criticism of George W. Bush at the time, but it's eternal. And I apply that in my book to areas that are much more reachable for readers, which is like, why are you afraid to let your kids go outside without supervision? Why are you afraid to send them to the park? Is it because you have let people on cable news convince you that there's a serial killer on every single corner and that you are a bad parent if you don't have your eyes on your kid it's all based in fear yeah and it, like today and i'm I, I i hate to sound like a grumpy old man but i really don't recognize the not just my community but my fellow americans that that seem to be totally engripped in their fears and not just the pandemic but politics seems in a way that that wasn't true even five years ago it's all us versus them it's all a caricature of the other side um and like it could be about about any debate if if you're a true anti-fascist um everybody that doesn't agree with you is a fascist Mm -hmm. um if you ever raise any questions about me too and i was talking to nancy rommelman on on this show uh, yesterday and she she's like she was because she said you know this might go too far she was tagged as celebrating rape culture so it's like it's everything's a caricature right like you're either with me or you're a monster and you're either with me or you're my enemy <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, uh, and yeah and so like there's one of my chapters is on the the importance of empathy and i build it off of a scene in the middle of The Force Awakens, Episode 7, where Rey has been held captive. She's been captured by Kylo Ren in the First Order. And she's she's tied up to this table, and she's like, you're a monster. And Kylo Ren steps back, doesn't say a word, pops his mask off, and slams it on the table. And he says, oh, she's like, I'm being chased by a creature in a mask. Mm -hmm. And he puts it on the table and looks at her, and he's he's a cute boy. (laughs) And she's like, oh, she just kind of like, trembles in that moment and she's like i'm gonna awkwardly make out with you yeah two and there's there's a lot of discourse about the the <laughs> subtones of that scene which uh which we could talk about another time but like when someone takes off their mask in front of you and shatters your worldview of what they are and who they really are underneath your perceptions of them it makes it harder to make them your enemy right. and somebody that needs to be destroyed from that moment on ray definitely dislikes kylo ren but she all of a sudden has a mission, which is she really would like to see him turn back the light and be Ben Solo again. Mm-hmm. And that is good. And that is what masks do for people is they allow them to hide from the world, either because they hate themselves or they are things that we put on them so that we don't have to look at their humanity and we can justify hating them, or killing them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So like and, and this 
like going back to your your media project, um, it seems quite difficult in a world where eyeballs are driven by sort of caricaturizing the other team. Um, how do you get people to have um, a human conversation again? Like, do, do people care? Or... I don't know. I mean, you're doing a very good job on this show, and it's something that I look up to very much, which is when you get somebody on your show and you get them to try to engage with the issues of the day, how do you stop them from going into pundit mode? You've been a pundit before. You've yeah. been a, a frequent face on Fox News. I've gone through a period of that myself, and you immediately become a different person. And it's not because of a malicious intent as soon as like the camera turns green and the guy in your ear says like, you're on, uh, the segment begins now. You're kind of terrified. You can't see who you're talking to in most cases right, on cable box, news. Yeah. And you have such a short amount of time to put your ideas out there. You could be interrupted at any moment. I'm not currently panicking about being interrupted <laughs> by either of you because we have time. Right. Um, and people say things on, on TV and on the news environment I don't think that they mean them. They're, right. they're like, they're like, ah, oh, I got to just throw stuff out there as quick as I can. And it's just a really bad cycle yeah. of people saying things that they don't entirely mean because they're kind of panicking mm -hmm. and then doubling down on them because apologizing or going back in the other way is weakness. And it's also not good television. It's a performance. <laughs> and I, I remember at one time, and I don't remember the context, but I used to go on Fox all the time when I was the Tea Party guy, right? Yeah. And You got to be a character in yeah, the show. The producer comes on. And this is a quote, and I won't quote to so tell you who the producer was, but he comes on and says, Matt, I'm going to need you to be a little less thoughtful and I'm a little more angry for this segment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, okay, I guess that's what we're doing here. But uh, recently, just a couple years ago, I went on MSNBC um, to talk about the sort of the, the left's tea party. Yeah. And I'm now forgetting. I think I remember this segment. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably and, more than a couple years and ago. And I had now. written what I thought was a really thoughtful piece about, like, a lot of conservatives were saying that the left's, the Women's March and all, I forget the name of the group now because there were so many manifestations of it. They're saying it's it's fake, it's funded by George Soros. And I'm like, dude, that is absolutely real. And it's real in the same way that the Tea Party was real. You cannot manufacture a mass gathering of people, it's its not something that you can buy. It, it has to be mm -hmm. an authentic thing. But I, and then I went on to criticize certain elements of it. It was it was just anti-Trump. It was, there was no cohesive values that, that held the movement together. And so I went on MSNBC thinking I was gonna have a thoughtful conversation about the pluses and minuses of this. And immediately they start attacking me about Obamacare. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm never doing this again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just, this is not where I'm at anymore. And I, I, I think it makes us a little bit dumber to do things that way. Um, but I got to believe, like, so MSNBC is trying to be Fox. Mm -hmm. And I guess CNN became another version of Fox. And they're, they're pandering to these, these potent minorities that, that are a, like to consume things that sort of reaffirm their biases. But doesn't that leave most people in the wilderness isn't isn't there a market oh well, we know it does yeah we know that there's a silent majority out there who are looking for something else it's why they're watching joe rogan or it's why they're even watching that hill tv show a cigar on jetty called rising right like it's it's a populist kind of tucker carlson young host and a kind of socialist bernie type um host crystal ball and they're talking to everybody else in sort of populist land which is the majority of people i mean Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, their audiences combined are shockingly small. And it's because there's an age gap between who's watching and the people who are watching are dying off every single day. And they're not being replaced with new audiences. So people are looking for something else. I mean, my struggle with right now is that I want it to be a place for sane, kind of longer form discourse. But how do you fight against the, the current and the pull, the magnetism of being divisive and yeah. trying to get those eyeballs. Um, but there are plenty of shows that do it just fine. I think Joe Rogan's an example. They just want to hear like people talk yeah. and not be sure all the time of exactly what they believe and try on each other's ideas, test them out, and then see where the conversation ends. It yeah. doesn't have to have an agenda. I always, I always thought, and I, I want to get back to hope, which is the other theme in, in Star Wars that, that really ties it, ultimately ties it together 
more fundamentally than Rebellions fear. Rebellions are built on hope, yeah. Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, now I forgot what I was going to say. I, so I, I do have a thought, though. Okay, you have a I thought. I think maybe ties into some a little bit of what we're what's going on with the MSNBC and the CN, mm-hmm. CNN and the Fox thing, is that, um, and this goes back to the Star Wars analogy, is that um, the lack of empathy in in the prequel trilogy, right? They're not empathetic to Anakin's problems. As a kid, he misses his mom. They say, well, get over it. Don't mm-hmm. deal with, you know. And eventually, that lack of empathy forms into Darth Vader, right? And he kills a bunch of people. and Not great. Um and and I feel like the lack of empathy on these shows and in this the the format that we're talking about here is what creates this these further fringe elements because no one can bother listening. Is that a a little bit? I think I think where my mind goes right there is that we are living in a world where the powers that be, corporate media, everyone else, they want you to believe that you are perfect. They want to tell you and reinforce that you are a righteous and virtuous person by nature of your experiences or by your victim status. And nobody has to engage with the fact that they are flawed and fallen human beings anymore. That's a thing that was good about religion in general was that it just reminded us all like we're all kind of down here cast out of the Garden of Eden. And Star Wars, there's a story within the canon, which is the Force Ghost. Uh, phenomenon. How do you become a force ghost? And it's a little confusing because Yoda becomes a force ghost, Obi-Wan becomes a force ghost, and then at the very end of Return of the Jedi, uh, Vader, now Anakin, becomes a ghost as well. And we didn't know why. Why was that? Is it simply just turning back to the light ends you up in like the blue apparition and you get to live forever? That's not the case. Not everybody can do that. It's a new thing that the Jedi had just discovered like that century. And it was started by Qui-Gon Jinn. When Qui-Gon was killed by Darth Maul, he was the first person in the afterlife to tap into that eternal essence, but he was not able to manifest his body. Then he passed that knowledge on to Yoda through a voice in his head. And what Yoda learned when he went into the afterlife actually this was before, but anyways, was that the only way to tap into eternal life and achieve being a force ghost was to know your dark self, to know the worst elements of yourself, confront it, recognize it, and control it, or it will control you. And the word that you learn in that story, which is in the Clone Wars saga, is laying down your hubris. If you cannot lay down your hubris and your sense of pride and virtue in yourself, you will never, in Star Wars, experience eternal life, and you will always be ruled by your emotions instead of the other way around. Yeah. That is some deep EU uh, digging. It's not EU! <laughs> it's the canon! Uh, this is, so that a lot of that is in the Clone Wars series, the animated yeah. show. Um, and it's one of the most important stories that you can learn in Star Wars, is just like, what does it really mean um, to have conquered your emotions and your shadow self? Nobody did that better than, than Darth Vader did. He was Anakin Skywalker, did horrible things, confronted who he really was deep down, and it was ugly. And then he was able to say, I actually am going to walk away from this and not let it control who I am anymore. And I think one of our main primary sicknesses in our society is that they just don't want you to believe that you have a dark side. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you don't know that you have a dark side, you will eventually do horrible things and, and be completely surprised by it. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. So bringing this back to um, sort of at least ideas, if not politics, that um, the, the hope versus fear thing, um, we, we libertarians are very good at being angry. Like, yeah. We're, we're raging against government and, and we, we see all of these injustices and, and we spend all of our time doing that. The thing that we suck at is, is offering hope mm-hmm. and, and imagining a better world and all the beautiful things that people could do if, if they were free and allowed to cooperate and, and build things together. And, and I, I've, I've talked about this before, but I, any conversation about Star Wars has to bring in Frederick Hayek. I feel obviously, um, and he, you know, he naturally he wrote uh, one of my new favorite essays. I had read it a long time ago, but I reread it recently. The Intellectuals and in Socialism, mm-hmm. and it's 1949, and he's trying to figure out why his classical liberalism is losing 
to authoritarians right and left, primarily the socialists, but obviously 1949 was generally not a great year for for uh, any sort of... Freedom was not on the march. <laughs> yeah, freedom was not on the march. <laughs> Something else. <laughs> and, and he ends this essay, it's a great essay and everyone should read it, but he ends it by saying, the thing that we have done wrong is, is by offering a constrained vision, uh, primarily driven by the things that we can't do through government and through society. Right, going too far on being against utopian thinking. Yeah. Right, because like socialists and fascists are really great utopians. They, yeah. can, mm -hmm. they can paint a picture of the world that we could have if only you would just stop being so gosh darn selfish about your yeah. individual liberties. Then we could live in the promised land. And when you have a promised land to look forward to, it does give people hope. Yeah. Um, you know, Christ gives people hope of redemption after death that, you know, they're not going to be held subject to their sins for all of eternity. That is the, de the de very definition of hope. Libertarians, there's one strand of libertarian thought, and I think it's probably like the human progress crowd, kind of part of Cato, which is like always pointing to like the world is getting better. The world is getting better despite a lot of the hype around the things that are not going well. But I just I struggle with that so bad because mm -hmm. it seems that there is still a rot in the soul of people today that while we are living more comfortably, child mortality is going down, we have lost our grasp of why are we here? Right. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? Yeah. And that gives people a huge sense of despair. And when people are ruled by their despair, they burn things down. Yep. We saw that on January 6th. We've seen that with the left for a long time it's part of their mm -hmm. like eco apocalypticism uh, where they don't even want you to have kids anymore because the world's going to be gone in 20 years anyways so don't do like the most you know in theory fulfilling thing that you can do which is raise another human being like it's sad right. there's mm -hmm. nothing there's nothing about that that's uh, tied to hope it's very it, fatalist and it's not it's not linked to material progress and i think that's another thing that that we libertarians do and i i wouldn't dismiss material progress as, as a pretty yeah. important way of, of lifting people to a place where they can be their best. But it, my, my sort of half-baked theory about AOC is that she authentically doesn't understand what it live, means to live in a world of scarcity. Mm -hmm. um, will I be able to feed myself? Will I have a roof over, over my head? Americans, generally speaking, um, don't worry about this stuff and and someone's head just exploded because i said that but uh, uh the rapper zuby made a point when he was on dave rubin you know he, he grew up in saudi arabia he's based in the uk his parents uh were born and raised in africa and and 30 i think the number he threw out which sounds about right um i won't swear by it because i haven't googled it recently but if you make thirty thousand dollars a year, you're in the top one percent yeah. in the global economy. So we don't we don't know what it means to wake up wondering whether or not we're going to live another day. So we we have to find meaning and purpose in something else, and mm -hmm. we're struggling with that. Mm -hmm. Which gets back to this whole thing about you know hope versus fear. It's not enough to be fed. I mean, being fed is really important. But it's not enough. It doesn't give you purpose. It doesn't give you meaning. It doesn't give you resiliency. Yeah. And um, one of the one of the things that I, I looked into and was researching for my book was looking at the Rebel Alliance and this rift that is laid bare in the Rogue One movie, mm -hmm. which is one of the best Star Wars movies and a reminder that Disney can do this right. I and will agree with that. They, they've they've got they've got strong creative pull. But Rogue One showed a rift within the Rebel Alliance that we really needed to see which was that you had this one faction with Mon Mothma, the lady in white, who we kind of know from Return of the Jedi. And she's, she's kind of like the neoliberal right of like the movement. She's, she's an institutionalist. Mm -hmm. She really believes the Republic was mostly good and it needs to be revived. That's what the Rebel Alliance is. It's the alliance to restore the Republic. And then you have this other rebel by the name of Saw Guerrero. He's, por he's portrayed by Morgan... Fre not Morgan no, Freeman. No, Goodness gracious. No. It's, um... <laughs> We're not cutting that out either. Uh, oh, my gosh. Ghost Dog. What's his name? Oh, my gosh. Um, I just totally blanked on it. But mm -hmm. anyway, so you have Saw Guerrero, and he is the burn it down rebel. The Empire was bad. The Republic was bad. And all the things that have happened in government are bad. And Saw Guerrero doesn't really have a movement based on hope. It's a movement based on anger and fear. Um, 
and uh, it's destructive. And then you have this story where you've got to build the rebel alliance. And how are you going to do it? Are you going to do it by saying, well, the Republic was really bad too, so why fight the Empire? You could lose everything if you do that. But no, the rebels have to choose this idea of hope, which is we can do this and we can make the world better if we try and we might lose everything. Yeah. Um, rebellions need a bit of anger. You have to have indignation and something, an ax to grind with the powers that be. But you have to be shooting for something. Otherwise, you end up with just, you know, lighting everything on fire and then standing amidst the rubble and going, all right, well, now what? <laughs> yeah. And that's that's to me like the secret sauce of and I call it libertarian populism. And, uh, um, you know, Ron Paul and Bernie Sanders essentially tapped into that same sort of angry rage against the machine kind of thing. You were pissed off at at crony capitalists and, and never ending war and the drug war and all of that stuff, and at a very superficial level, they were saying exactly the same thing. Um, but the the uh, resonance for us is that we actually have a way that people from all different walks of life, from different religions and different countries and different communities could get together peacefully and not just cooperate, but learn to, to respect and, and honor each other. Um, you can't do that if your goal in politics is to win everything and destroy the other side. Mm -hmm. So we, I feel like we have this, this, this beautiful alternative vision, but it's, uh, we, we, we forget to tell people about it sometimes and, and we forget to, uh, um, um, too often use libertarians that. are like Saw Gerrera. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's not clicky, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And I think the, the Saw Gerrera poll can again just be saying like, well, all government is bad and it, it just, you know, destroys people's lives. But, and this is, this is the ax I have to grind with, with the libertarian movement is that if you, if you are constantly just telling people that like government can only do bad things and do harm, then what are we like, what are they going to look forward to? Or like, what are they going to try to build or invest their trust in? I, I don't want people to blindly trust the government and just go along with everything that it wants to do. But at the same time, government is still us. We are still able to govern ourselves. And if you just tell people that nothing good can come of this, I, I don't know where we go from here. You end up with two sides of the political divide that basically want revolution. Because if government doesn't work, you, you revolt and you overturn it and start again. I don't want to start again. Yeah. Um, and so that's that's where I'm trying to figure out, like, where do we have constructive libertarianism that engages in good governance? And I, I know this is going to get me in trouble, but, like, I really want to try to figure out what that looks like. Yeah, and I, I, I think, and, and I would push back by using that same word. Governance, to me, is bottom up. Mm -hmm. It's it's very Hayekian in the sense of, of people working together and developing social institutions that hold us together as, as a fabric of a nation, whereas government is someone with unchecked power um, sort of hijacking that process and imposing mm -hmm. on us from the top down. And, and Mike Lee, a, a fairly um, credible constitutional conservative, has this basic Tenth Amendment view that the reason we fight all the time is that we've put all of, all of our eggs in the presidency. Yes. And if our guy doesn't win, we're ruined, we're destroyed. And and his point is, let's, let's shift it back. And he wants to shift it back to the states. I want to shift it back even further. Did you, uh, did you ever read David French's recent Divided We Fall book on America's secession threat? It was one of my favorite books from the past year. It's Divided We Fall by David French. And he basically is looking at government as this thing has gotten too big, too powerful, and we have forgotten that if we lower the temperature of every election, then we will have a better politics. Because if it is all out war and survival for the presidency, uh, everything, all bets are off, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's very true. And I'm going to keep taking it back to Star Wars. What did Tarkin think the Death Star was going to do? He said... If we have this weapon, and it's called the Tarkin Doctrine, that all the systems are going to fall in line through mm -hmm. fear, right? And Leia says, you know, like it's, the harder you tighten your grip, the more star systems are going to slip through your fingers. There was a belief that the Death Star, the ultimate power to take life, was going to make people be subservient. 
That's not what people actually tend to do. Most people will fall in line for a little while, but eventually they're going to fight back because it is their life that is on the line. And that's where you get the Rebel Alliance. You believe that people are just going to fall over for the Death Star. They don't. It rallies them against it, mm -hmm. and it brings the entire galaxy up in revolt and tosses off the Empire. we got to dismantle the Death Star and lower the temperature of politics. Yeah. Yeah, and I I mean, I, I think that, and I don't know if it's a, the chicken or the egg, but this this intolerance and cancel culture and and wokeness and us versus them and you're either an anti-fascist or you're a fascist that that whole thing um i don't know how we dismantle the the central power that is probably driving that and i don't know what comes first because the easy solution the flippant solution for libertarians is well just don't give the president so much power and, and everything's solved right um but how, how do we get here and, and how do we dismantle it is, is I, I don't have an answer. I wonder how much of that, though. It, I mean, the whole the wokeism is a it's a cultural rot and it's a fear based on culture. I mean, it's not even linked. It, it's linked to politics, but it's it's enforced by people who subscribe to that doctrine. And until enough people push back on it or just start ignoring it and it's I don't think it goes away, but it, it it's not a. It's not a political. There's not. There's not a political solve for wokeism. I don't think. I don't. I don't. I, well, and I mean, especially you look at in. It's you were talking about earlier with regards to Star Wars fandom. I mean, the wokeism cancel culture has created this rift about something that people used to enjoy together, and it used to be a gathering point, and now you have to pick a a side on a bunch of ridiculous nonsense. Um, right. That's regardless. That totally separate from your enjoyment of. The franchise. Yeah, you can't have a conversation on whether or not this this or movie this movie or that movie was good. It has to be about the intention of the director. It's like it goes right. back to the Last Jedi, right? Like, did they did they nerf Luke Skywalker just to like make a point about masculinity and in, in way mm -hmm. of feminism, or is it just possible that a hero from your childhood could actually maybe bottom out and uh, become jaded? And I I was just never offended by that notion right. that like a hero could maybe hit rock bottom and need to be re uh, built back up again. Um, I don't really get why that bothers people, but there is a conservative notion about the importance of tradition <laughs> that like the only thing that can make us happy is Luke Skywalker coming back in the Mandalorian spoiler for season two um, and being a hero again and being triumphant and matching your view of how you viewed that hero when you were young. Um, I just don't view things as being that sacred. I, I kind of like to see like sacred things torn down. That's part of my libertarianism. <laughs> or, or more human, like there's, there's this, uh, you know, these these fictional heroes who are kind of like a, a reconception of George Washington, the guy that was was so honest that he gave up power. And in politics, we're all looking for the next guy like that. So acknowledging that Luke Skywalker was not perfect, that he was human, he had his failings, he lost confidence in himself, whatever that is, yeah, um, that's what people are. They want us to to treat every like character from from our pop culture and our fiction like they're Mao or something, and that mm -hmm. we need to go cry at their grave and <laughs> and remember the great creator who gave us life and our government and everything. And it's again, it goes back to like our need to have stories that give us a grounding mm -hmm. for our entire existence. And if you're a communist, it begins with the state. And if you're a Star Wars fan of a certain a certain generation, it's like all about like the Luke Skywalker story. And I just I just don't view it as being sacred. <laughs> to me, it was always about Han Solo's story. So really. <laughs> I, Luke Skywalker didn't matter to me. Who no, cares? I, I, never, I never liked Luke. No. And so this is maybe this is what it all comes back yeah. to is he just never really was very interesting to me. I, I was more Han, upset so. that they made Han Solo like a deadbeat dad. <laughs> right, right. Although yeah. kind of fitting, but still, you're like, I thought he changed at the end. Nope, nope. <laughs> nope. Han and Leia get divorced. The end of Return of the Jedi is not a happy ending. It's just a break before the next yeah. round of awfulness. I mean, it makes sense that they'd get divorced. He's obviously out playing the galaxy. You can't yeah. keep that man she, down. She she's won. got a she's got a republic to build. Yeah. She uh, she goes all in on her political career. He goes back doing what he knows, which is smuggling. And <laughs> Kylo Ren ends up with uh with Snoke for a dad. Well, well, with crappy Uncle Luke as a dad, who <laughs> obviously never settled down, had kids of his own. So how is he supposed to raise them? Now, see, I, I think the exception to all of this was Yoda, who was my um, moral, spiritual animal on this stuff. But 
I, I propose this theory, and you're, you're going to try to debunk it, but it is my belief, uh, I propose it to Andrew Heaton, it is my belief that uh, Grogu is Yoda's illicit love child, mm. and that this whole scandal is going to blow up, and we're going to sort of lose this this spiritual reverence towards Yoda. <laughs> well, Yoda and Yaddle. They, yeah, they, got, they got together off screen in episode one. <laughs> hey, there, she was there. <laughs> she was there. It's possible. There was a she Yoda. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not uh, just as he's scorning Anakin, uh, you with your feelings, he's got to, you know. I won't, I won't uh, fan explain to you when Grogu was born or any of that. Time, I'm not sure that time, time and space matter, matter <laughs> um, when it comes to, to fan fiction. You can sort of build no. the reality you want. And it's in Star Wars, awesome. you can have immaculate conceptions, obviously. So that has been proven. That's uh... or was it Qui Gon? <laughs> There's, uh, there's that fan theory. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're we're gonna wrap up by could have been Jar Jar. We're gonna wrap up by getting you canceled on Kibbe on Liberty, um, because I've been told, and and my crack research team has been digging through all of your tweets. Oh great! And Uh-oh. and speaking of the Mandalorian, I am told that you supported the firing of, of Gina Carrara. Not supported. I'm just not super sympathetic. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not super sympathetic to what went on there. The narrative that was being spun in the outset, and I know you've talked about it yourself, and it's, it's totally fine. It's just like, what to what extent, when you're employed by somebody, are you able to just continually piss them off, no. <laughs> right? Like, I want to live in a world, personally, I remember this because I grew up in it, where when you worked for a certain company, there was like kind of an expectation that you chilled out online and respected the values of that company because everything you said was you know going to be tied back to them we've since changed in the culture where it's a free-for-all and that's mostly been driven by the left Mm -hmm. the left views their their values as not up for debate and as basic and foundational so if you are a left employee at any company you can say whatever you want if you're right you can't because it's an attack on people Um, but i still hold this idea that if a company has asked you to stop being crazy online then you need to stop and i i, I just that was some... is that what happened like she's she was at this for a year and yeah. and I, I i'm i'm sorry to the audience but this started a, a year before it actually ever went down and it went down originally for a good reason she tweeted out the picture of uh the the german with his arms crossed um, at a Nazi rally, right? And this was during the Black Lives Matter movement first taking off after George Floyd was killed or, you know, picking up steam again. Um, and she tweeted out this picture vaguely. And people were like, what are you saying? Are you, are you saying that we're all like, you know, goot stepping along on, on Black Lives Matter? And she kind of was like, eh, you know, just saying conformism bad. And this is what started the Gina Carano witch hunt. They started mm-hmm. coming after her after that. And then there was the beep bop boop trans- transgression against gender pronouns, which Mm -hmm. again, for them is a religion. Um, I support being transgressive and trying to break norms and challenge people. But there's just this part of me that goes, how long did you think that you were going to remain employed if you just could never stop? Jon Favreau was covering for her. Mm -hmm. We were behind, behind the scenes. He was running interference between her and the Lucasfilm board and trying to keep her on as long as possible. And out of respect for Jon Favreau, Who's trying to save your ass? Yeah. Like, when do you stop and control yourself a little bit? Mm-hmm. So this this is where I'm just a little bit torn, and I I'm happy to discuss it. Obviously, as we're here. I, so. I agree with his. I mean, this is the what I was talking about earlier. It's like the only problem that I have is that the 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 line isn't enforced on both sides, of which course. drives me nuts. But drives me nuts. It, I I w- I I wish that celebrities went back to just shutting up generally right. I, I mean that's what we all want is, is <laughs> the, the I, or, I mean especially because these like the problem is is this this stuff the these actions need to make something that is meant to be i think a unifying cultural ex- experience right yeah like yeah into something that's needlessly divisive um because the show the mandalorian isn't particularly about any of this nonsense nope um so so creating it as a flashpoint where now you have to, you know, you don't have to because I don't believe you should subscribe to this, but you're you're forced to decide, well, I'm my political allegiance is me and I must not view this thing because mm-hmm. it did this other thing that upset me outside of the actual merits of the thing. Um, I just I wish that that 
people were either, you know, either if you're going to post your opinions online or willing to deal with the blowback, or if you're a company, you were to actually enforce things across the spectrum. Yeah. Because there are other cast members on that show that obviously, Pedro Pascal. Pedro Pascal, you know, yeah, he can say Matt whatever online. he wants. Call MAGA hats, Nazi hats. And, right. You know, uh, liken, liken the camps on the border to concentration camps. Which the camps on the border are really bad. And uh, very full <laughs> right now. Very full. Um, so, you know, I, I get it. I guess I'm just, I'm reluctant to buy into the victim yeah. part of it. And I think that's maybe where the disagreement is. It's a, and I, I, you know, I, I think I actually agree with both of you, but the, the question, and this gets mm -hmm. to tech censorship generally, um, there is an easy solution to this, and I don't think it's a regulatory solution. It's a solution that says, tell us what the rules are, give us transparency, give us a transparent process by which you would sort of adjudicate someone breaking the rules and apply it across the yep. board. That's what we need. We need yeah. we need standards and rules of the road. Um, again, kind of going back to when I was first entering the workforce, like there were rules. Like when yeah. I remember when I was like signing my papers for a job at a hotel, or I was signing my papers for a job at a nonprofit. There was like social media codes of conduct. Yeah. Um, I, nobody has an, a sense of where the rules are and where those lines are. And what eventually got Gina Carano fired, I think, was. A pretty foolish thing to pull the trigger on honestly of like all the things she's done like me <laughs> like the things that she's done on parlor and like pushing conspiracy theories yeah. about the vaccine and the election like i would have maybe done it on that <laughs> just say but like just putting a thing out there that you know we don't want uh, our politics to reach the level of nazi germany discrimination where you view jews as the the enemy mm -hmm. uh, uh, of the country that you don't want that in politics either like okay i, I get what you're saying it's a little inartful and i really hate nazi analogies because they're right. always just dumb yeah don't don't do it anymore it's, it's just yeah, it's it, dumb it, it like makes our politics much much stupider yeah um to make everything about nazi germany but like i was curious as like why was that it um and there's not really a good reason for but it. This, like, I think because it was public and it was the last straw. I, it, 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 and, and they, it, it all, all these things always seems to be like you keep pushing on it. Like you said, the House of Mouse probably told her multiple times, yo. And she's talked about it. Yeah, there, <laughs> there were meetings. That, and they also, they, they put her through like apology trainings, right? Where right. They, and she talked about this with Ben Shapiro, where they like put her on a call with activists to talk about the harm that like mocking pronouns does so that she can be educated. It's mm -hmm. always about you're not educated. Right. And that's why that's why you're bad. Right. And after you learn, then you won't be bad anymore. But she she told us who she was at the very beginning. And I respect this. Mm -hmm. I cross my arms. I will not go along with what you tell me to do. And at the same time, Black Lives Matter was taking off and, and celebrity culture was enforcing that you needed to put like hashtag BLM into mm -hmm. your bio or you were on the other side. There was that same incident of Black Lives Matter protesters going after people dining on the streets of downtown mm -hmm. yeah. here in D.C., surrounding them and uh, demanding they put their fist up. And if they didn't put their fist up, they were the enemy. Right. And my political persuasion, and I, I was talking about this before the show to y'all, is like, I go to church, but I, I've never put my hand in the air. There's something about it that like just I can't lay it down. And it's a probably a personality fault where like when people are singing and the hands start going up, it makes me want to put my hands in my pocket mm -hmm. because I don't know, like, are you doing this because the person next to you is doing this? Or are you doing this because you really have laid it all down and you really are feeling the song and feeling the word? Or are you just doing it because it's what the group is doing? And I hate that. Yeah. Um, and I, that's who Gina is. Yeah. And I, I respect that about mm -hmm. her. But at what point can a company just say, like, you are more trouble than you are worth? Mm -hmm. We can replace you. <laughs> so it's not. It is like I, I have conflicting ideas on this. And I think it is sort of a cultural shift because um, certainly when I was a kid, like it, particularly if you worked for a corporation, you you couldn't go out and just shoot your mouth off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even when I ran a big um free market organization, I told everybody, whatever you say, not only reflects on this organization, but it reflects on a community that we all represent. So if, if you say something stupid, you might get fired. But we all consume, um, we're, we're big into music, you're actually a musician, you're into Bruce Springsteen, mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm into music, and I'll, I'll tell two stories, and I wanna sort of end on this because it's a conflicting vision. I, my gateway to libertarianism was reading the liner notes on a rock album. 
and lyrics written by Neil Peart, who is really into Ayn Rand. And, and I think that that's, that that's a transformative story in my life. And he took a lot of shit for it. Like they, they were demonized actually as, as Nazis for, mm-hmm. for being sort of libertarian objectivist types, which was doubly ugly because the lead singer's parents actually escaped concentration camps. So it was just like that, that contradiction. But I'm also a big uh, jam band fan and the lead singer of Fish, Trey Anastasio, who's from Burlington, Vermont, mm, and, and other members of his band were way out there for Bernie. And he, he publicly criticized them. He's like, you probably know where I'm coming from, but I respect my fans enough mm-hmm. not to burden them with my political opinions. Mm-hmm. And so like, I see both sides of the story. I sort of like it when music that I love turns out to be made by people that, that share my values. But on the other hand, I'm like, why are you burdening us with this stuff? This is not why we like you. What's yep. what's the right answer? My feeling as a, and why is Springsteen such a commie? Yeah, I know. So as a, as the as a Bruce fan, I feel like I have a lot to answer for. But my feeling is is generally is that he addresses a lot. Of, like what's in the songs are what I care about, and I and I think that you know at shows when he's had uh, gone on some political comments. I remember during the Magic tour, which was you know, I, you know, uh, I think towards the end of the Bush years, maybe beginning, I, it was at the end of Bush years. Nothing he said was wrong where he was complaining about the Patriot Act, basically. Totally right. Now, I wish that he applied that principle over, you know, the following uh, eight and years. But, well, will he ask Barack Obama about right. and he didn't. And <laughs> about so, so, civilians? so, um, but t- to me, um, there's one thing if you can let your art speak for itself. It's another thing if you, the art that you make doesn't reflect your values, but then you decide I need to go, you know, as part of this art, go talk about stuff that's sort of irrelevant to the art. Um, yeah, when you when you ask people to accept your beliefs on other parts of their life that aren't connected to you being a fan, mm-hmm. it, it becomes attack. It becomes like, if you are not with me, you are against me. Mm-hmm. Um, I need you to go vote for Hillary Clinton mm-hmm. and also buy my new record. And and also the, the money that I get from the record, I'm going to donate to Hillary Clinton. So it's all like tied together, right? Mm-hmm. Like when you're following a celebrity. I just, I get really anxious around treating people like avatars of your movement or your ideas. And like with Gina Carano, I remember when The Mandalorian first debuted, and I remember Star Wars YouTube land lighting up when a buff female Mm -hmm. uh, former wrestler showed up on The Mandalorian and decked The Mandalorian in a fist fight and took him down. YouTube freaked out. Mm -hmm. They were not happy about this feminazi character being (laughs) introduced to The Mandalorian um, and pushing the same kind of feminism that we saw like with the introduction of Rey. I remember these same people saying that. And then when Gina Carano gets fired, they go, she belongs to us. Yeah. She belongs to the fans. She's what made Mandalorian great. Is she what made Mandalorian great? She was in I don't like think, two episodes? I don't like? think she is. <laughs> You're treating her like she is the be all end all and a symbol of, of your identity. And I just, I don't buy it. I don't yeah. buy into that. Yeah. It'd be one thing in my, is that if, if the, if the art actually espouses some sort of value and you, that's your attachment to it. And it, it's another thing if it's simply that the person playing a character written by someone else espouses a value that you identify with. And then that's yeah. like the flashpoint. That's what drives me nuts is that if the thing is inherent to the art, which, you know, if back to Bruce magic was very much, that album was very in many ways obliquely about the, you know, never ending war. Right. Um, but it's still a lessonable rock record and it's not necessarily bashing you over the head, at least in my opinion, but I spin zone a lot. Whereas the Mandalorian isn't about any of this stuff. And you know, it's basically a Western lone wolf and cub pastiche. Basically. Um, There's a, um, another example that just pissed me off so much. I'm a huge Neil Young fan and Neil Young, wrote one of the greatest protest songs, uh, you know, Four Dead in Ohio. Mm-hmm. Um, just beautiful. 
And he recently rewrote, I don't even remember the name of the song, I've tried to block it out of my mind, but he recently rewrote one of his songs and the lyric is, Joe Biden's wonderful, we should elect him now. And I'm like, <laughs> fuck you. Like, you just, you just ruined, like... A lot of, of cultural stuff. That beautiful stuff. melody has yeah. been destroyed. It's one thing if you want to go do an event. It's a whole other thing if you want to rewrite to show. Right. It, I just said, and and supposedly his his wife Daryl Hannah has oh. has imposed this political activism on him. But I'm I'm confused about it. And and uh, the next interview I'm going to do on this show is with Zuby, the rap uh, artist, nice. who has defined his career as being outspoken and and he's um you know I, I don't know if he's conservative or libertarian he doesn't identify himself he's like mm, i don't yeah. i don't fit your spectrum but but he he has taken the opposite tact like this is who i am i have strong opinions about things and it's even in his music and i i think that's a legit path to take yeah and i think that at the heart of the the question here is do we want to live in a society where everyone is as outspoken as possible and everybody tolerates, right? Because you can you can get on the rooftop and shout your political opinions, mm -hmm. however benign or ugly they are, and you expect your neighbors to be like, oh, that's just Jim. Nice guy. Our, our kids play t-ball together. Mm -hmm. Or do you want a society where people put their politics really at the back rung of their lives? They're not eager to be super outspoken and to see if they can ruffle feathers. And we respect each other in that way because we know that politics is touchy and a big part of our lives. I'm, I'm a little torn on which one of those worlds I want. Yeah. And that's that's at the heart of like my, my Gina Carano divide is like, I just don't know which world I want. Um, I, th I think the, I think you used a word respect there that mm -hmm. it your tone in talking about your values. And again, this is what we're trying to do in all of our projects. It's, it's about tone, like you, you can talk down to people and, and tell them with, with just your intonation that they're too stupid to understand where you're coming yeah. from. Or you can say, this is what I believe, I understand other people don't believe this, but, but I just want you to know how I see things. And, and to me, I want that world and, yeah. and, and sort of teaching people how to respect differences is probably the key to that. And, and nobody uses that tone anymore. It's all it's all finger jabbing, right? Mm -hmm. It is. It I is. wanted the latter world of your description, but I don't think that exists. That can't go. We can't put the genie back into the bottle about sharing our political opinions about stuff. No, we can't. We need a disarmament. We've been Taylor uh, Swift. Yeah. Did. And uh, and is this is a... what I will I will resolve all of this in how the force can fix the world Good. in December when everybody's picking it up for Christmas presents for themselves and their loved ones. Perfect. Uh, nice. It's it's not only going to heal your politics, but it's also going to make you a happier person. Nice. <laughs> that, that, that was that was that was the shame, most shameless plug I've ever seen. <laughs> That's a good plug. It, it is it is nice to to have a a, a, a more positive conversation about star wars too frequently um star wars fandom is such a nasty place i love days. star wars it's it is it is a core part of who i am yeah. and i refuse i refuse to let the political grifters and hacks make me resent it or yeah. be angry about it i'm gonna keep loving on it i'm gonna critique the art where i think it falls short and has maybe like abdicated its responsibility to tell story and instead put politics first but I'm gonna keep enjoying it. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna let someone take that away from me for politics. It's just not worth it. Let's let's give a, a shameless plug for Young Voices and, uh, and other places where we can find your stuff, um, because we can't wait until December to get more Stephen Kent. We need some <laughs> right now. Yeah. So the the best way to stay in touch and and kind of follow some of the work is my Substack. I'm a, I'm a rebel and on Substack, uh, unfiltered by the mainstream media. But you can go to politicizeme.substack.com, subscribe to the newsletter, talking about the book, and I'm also writing essays there about the politics of Star Wars and sometimes some other things. Um, and then my work with Young Voices is a huge part of my life. Um, just a great nonprofit. And You've you recruited a lot of guests for this show. I try to and, recruit a and lot and of guests for this you'll show. You'll have some more yeah. coming up. Yeah. And uh, okay, let's leave it there. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks, Matt. That was amazing. Where can I get more content just like that? It's a great question. You're clearly a discerning consumer of the best content. Make sure to like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. And if you're consuming podcasts, go to Apple, Stitcher, anywhere you get them. I'm in. Kibbe on Liberty, honest conversations with interesting people.